announcements for you all here in class, um, which I also added to our Canvas page. So for those of you who are doing the Your Water, Your Life contest, um, the applications are gonna be due September 30th. In the actual contest website, they changed the due date to November 30th, but we're keeping September 30th because we're on a shortened timeline because of our work ending the semester in December. Um, so we're gonna make those due September 30th. I put an example application form on Canvas. So if you wanna see what the questions they will ask, you can look through that just so you know before you open the application form. Um, and then we'll have to set up the midpoint check-ins probably do those around October 31st or before then, just to, it's it's basically just like, how's the project going and see how things are going along. Um, the second announcement, which I'm very excited about and I'm hoping to snag some of you, um, I am leading a water workforce listening session at the Office of Engagement and Extension Forum that's happening this Thursday, 1030 to 12. And it's at the Hilton, which is unfortunate. I wish it were here, which would make it a little easier to attend, but um, I would love to hear from students about their needs as they're going into the water workforce. What is missing? What do you wish you had? Um, what information or contacts or whatever your needs may be, we wanna hear from you. It's intended to bring together faculty, staff, students, and extension to just listen, see what's what's going on, what people are already doing, and then kind of trying to identify some of the gaps and how to fill those gaps. So um, the information is also on Canvas if you want to look and learn more about that. So, but I'd love if you could come. Um, really important to have the student perspective there. Okay, so any questions about the class before I start with our, our guest lecture today? Okay, well, I am so excited to introduce Corey DeAngelis. He is the Division I engineer um, for the Division of Water Resources at the Department of Natural Resources. And I'm gonna read his bio here. He was born in Colorado on the Front Range. He grew up both on the Front Range and in San Luis Valley in Southern Colorado. He received a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Colorado State University in 1995. Prior to joining the Division of Water Resources team, in 2006, Corey worked as a private consulting engineer in civil and water resources projects, primarily in the San Luis Valley and southwestern Colorado from 95 to 2006. And after joining the Division of Water Resources in 2006, he spent the first five years in the Division Three office in Alamosa, acting as the water measurement branch chief and assistant division engineer involved in both surface and groundwater administration in Division Three. In 2011, he transferred to the Division I Greeley office as the lead assistant division engineer from 2011 until 2018, at which time he was appointed the Division I engineer. He has been involved in both surface water and tributary groundwater, including designated basin groundwater administration in Division I. Corey has been involved in administrating and ensuring compliance with several interstate compacts and agreements in both Divisions I and III, and he has been involved in division water court matters through participation in division summary of consultations with the water referee and contributing to and authoring expert reports, testimony and de depositions, and at trial as an expert in factual and lay witness in water court in civil cases. So welcome, Corey. We are very excited to have you and talk to us about the South Platte River administration and Thanks. all of the ins and outs. So here's the well thank you she she gave away i went here a long long time ago so last time i was presenting here i was thinking well yeah just 10 15. i was doing the math and i thought well that can't be right there's no there's no way it's been that long since i went to, to class here but but i'm glad to be back thank you for having me um today i wanted to focus on on administration and a little bit of what our agency does division water resources hopefully most of you know what we do but a lot of the circles People have no idea what it is we do. Uh, it's a very unique and important role in Colorado. So I wanted to hit the, the high notes on administration and kind of give you a day in the life of our boots on the ground, our water commissioners, for those of you that know them, but these are the people out in the field in each each water basin, um, whether it be Clear Creek or the Cache Lafouter Basin. Uh, we got people out on the on the ground running things. 
we're we're a small agency statewide, just around 300 employees, and we've got about 51 employees out of Division One, which is the South Platte River Basin and the Republican River Basin, uh, a big area to cover with 51 people, and about half of them are are out of home offices in the districts that they administer, and the rest of us are in our main office in Greeley, and we have a, a branch office in Sterling. Okay. Yeah, there we go. So who we are, we're, we're a small agency. We're in the Department of Natural Resources, one of eight divisions. I I think we're listed last on their website because we're very important. Uh, we get the most hits. I'm sticking to that. Um, our mission uh, is to administer the waters of the state and to maximize the lawful beneficial use. So, so keep those two things in mind. We do a lot of other things than administer water. Um, we ensure that dams and water wells are properly constructed and safe. And we provide information about water resources to the public. And, and as it mentioned in my bio, we also participate in all water court matters. Uh, we, we act normally as an advisor to the water courts on, on all applications. And unless we have a real opposition to a particular application, then we, we, we don't advise or communicate with the water court. We, we enter as an objector and participate in the case. Here's real high level org chart, the state engineer at the top, the deputy uh, director, the deputy state engineers, um, and then the seven division engineers. We'll get into what that means. So again, that's just how everything goes down from, from the state engineer's office. The state engineer's office, Um, is located in, in downtown Denver by the Capitol. And then each major drainage across the state has a division office. We're division one in the north northeast corner. So a little bit about what we do again, just is just touching the surface. We we um, handle water administration. So all the waters of the state, both groundwater and surface water, we're responsible for administering those. Uh, public safety, dams and wells, uh, groundwater well permitting interstate compacts, uh, hydrographic program. So hydrographers, raise your hand if you're familiar with them. Okay, good. They, they maintain stream gauges. They also assist our water commissioners in their administration by going out and verifying the accuracy of all the diversion structures off the stream, all the measurement structures. Uh, public information services, we've really, really gotten good at getting all our information available online to the public, uh, which is wonderful when, it, when it's working, when it's down. It's, it's a little more difficult. And uh, special studies as assigned by the legislator and other committees uh, that we, we were tasked with those as well. <laughs> there are seven divisions across the state, again, broken in, broken by geographical major drainages. Northeast corner up here is division one. I'm gonna touch on that. Uh, primarily the South Platte River Basin, but out here is also the Republican River Basin that uh, we administer that. And then as you go around, that's division one, we're the number one division. Uh, division two is is uh, the Arkansas River Basin and their office is based out of Pueblo and so forth uh, around major drainage basins. So I'm gonna talk on a high level, give a little background on water administration. What do we do? Uh, where do we get our authority? What are, what are we tasked to do for, for the state? <clears throat> kind of a historic background and I apologize some of this hopefully wasn't covered before my presentation. I'm gonna got a lot of slides here. I talk fast and I talked a lot. So um, I'll try to get through all these, uh, but I thought it'd be good reference to include these in here. But we've been around for a long time, 1879, the water commissioner position. I talked about boots on the ground. They, they existed actually before the state engineer existed in 1879. Um, it's in our state constitution. We'll get into that in more detail about the, the constitutional right to appropriate waters of the state. Uh, and, and we're the mechanism that, that uh, administers that water. Uh, 1881, the Office of the State Engineer was, was formed in 1887, the superintendent of irrigation. So, so when we say we've been doing this for more than 100 years, we, we really have. Um, since 1887, we had the, the framework. And we'll get into a little bit of history, more specific to the South Platte Basin, but it, it applies across the state. Keep those dates in mind, and you'll see why, why it was necessary for for that to develop so so early in our, our statehood. Um, our duties are also laid out in the constitution. The water of every natural stream is hereby declared to be the property of the public, 
subject to appropriation is here and after provided. And it also provides that the priority of appropriation shall give the better right as between those using the water uh, for the same purposes. So again, it, it sets out um, that the waters belong to the state and people have a right to use them and, and that that use has, has a, a, it's based on priority. Also, we're guided by statute in our duties at Division Water Resources, Section 3792-501 of the Colorado Revised Statute, uh, provides that the state engineer and the division engineer shall administer, distribute, and regulate the waters of the state in accordance to the Constitution. Again, ties back to the, the state Constitution, as well as um, 3792-102, that, that administration be done in accordance with the prior appropriation doctrine, uh, as well as we're tasked with maximizing the beneficial use of the water. So we're going to hit on all of that in our administration, but those are our primary goals that are to administer water in priority in accordance to the doctrine of prior appropriation while maximizing the beneficial use of that water. So Craig, you may have covered this. I don't know if Jennifer covered this, but um, Colorado's water administration system, our frameworks based on the prior appropriation doctrine, which means those that put the water to use first uh, in time are entitled to get their water first. So in, in times of shortage, the people that put their water to, to use first and have the more senior appropriation get the right to that water. So if we don't have enough water, those with junior appropriations aren't entitled to take water uh, until the seniors are fulfilled. Uh, other things that guide our administration and our authority, uh, we mentioned co the constitution statute, water court decrees, uh, rulings of the Supreme Court and compacts. Um, there's also some some agreements that we we administer as well. And, and another important one, if you haven't, I think it was provided with with Jennifer as as reference reader or, or maybe by you, but uh, the 1969 Water Right Determination Act. It's great. Read it. I, I know I'm kind of <laughs> that's my thing. And I, I think it's great. I, I can't read it enough. But um, in 1969, it, it laid out a lot of things. That's why it, it's so amazing and really really reinforced and set the framework moving forward that we work under today. But it reinforced the recognition of the connection between groundwater and surface water. And, and, and it also integrated the groundwater into the priority system and, and introduced the concept of plans for augmentation. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail as we go. So I'm gonna dive into more detail, administration specific to the South Platte River Basin. Um, but to understand how we administer water and the complexities, it, it really is, um, quite the amazing web, um, but you got to understand how how water developed. You can see here. Hopefully, you can see the color. But but the the green highlights, which are mostly um, from from the divide in in the upper headwaters of each drainage basin. Each each one of these numbers represents. This is a blow up of of water division number one, the South Platte River Basin. Here's the South Platte River, um, and out here is the Republican. But but each one of these is a is a is a tributary uh, feeding into the South Platte River. And each one of these is a water district, again, around a geographical drainage. For example, Clear Creek is District 7, and it's primarily Clear Creek and everything that drains into it to its confluence with the South Platte and, and so on. But but um, the gold rush, that, that's when it started. It's what necessitate, necessitated our structure. You can imagine um, you came out here to get rich. You got set up up in the mountains. You're the first one in the area. You're going out to run your sluice gate to divert the water off the stream. That's why you, you camped there. So you had water to do that. And you go out one morning, you're ready to get rich and there's no water. What happened? Well, someone else came in a month, a year after you and did the same thing right above you. So as you can imagine, chaos, fighting, a lot of bad things ensued and, and, and made it necessary for our framework of the priority system, doctrine of prior appropriation and, and enforcement of that. Um, and, and really, my understanding, uh, when that developed, the ones that really did well and had a steady income were those feeding the miners and, and the cattle and the horses and the mules. Um, but they also started, you know, with the mining diversions and then also diverting water off to grow crops and, and uh, to feed livestock and so forth. So, so as that developed in the upper tribs uh, during the, the, the mining rush in the 1860s, it made it a more reliable source, and we'll talk a little bit more what I mean by that. But as you divert water off the stream and you put it, say, on a crop, uh, part of that water percolates back into the groundwater system and runs off on the surface back to the stream. 
Um, and then a portion of it's obviously used and consumed by the crop. But you retime that water. So a portion, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent of that water that you divert out of the stream, you put back into the system. It makes its way back to the stream system and it, it really changes the timing of that. So even after the snow melt, the snow melt and the runoff ran out, there was still a, a dependable supply as they started spreading it out here. So this this middle portion here, basically from from Clear Creek, which is near the intersection I-76 and I-25 down to about Greeley, developed after that as, as it became more dependable supply in the 1870s. And then the same thing happened. Um, they started colonizing things down here. There was more dis the dependable supply of water. Communities sprung up and they did community irrigation projects. When I say colonized, a lot of our big ditches, that's how they were developed. They all took part in that mutual ditch and they helped construct the, that infrastructure. And as they, as they again, apply that water to crops and, and other things, it, it made this section more dependable um, because of that lagging of those return flows. You know, in early times during the mining, even prior to mining, this was described down here. Very rarely did water make it to the state line. And, and when it did, it was just during snow melt and real high runoff. And, and then it was gone. And it was a pretty desolate area until, until all this development occurred. This is our, our typical diagram. Uh, we call it the snake diagram because it looks like a lot of snakes on there. But what this shows is the annual flows. Uh, for each major stream system in the state, and you can see the seven divisions there. Um, and and the wider that line is, is the magnitude of the flow. So so if it's it's wider, that means there's a lot more annual flow to that system. And and for comparison, you can see the size of the flows in the Colorado River, 4.4 million, compared to the South Platte here, less than a million acre feet annually. Trans Mountain diversions. Um, this shows each individual Trans Mountain diversion, and what a Trans Mountain diversion is is it it intercepts water that that if it weren't impacted or impeded, it would flow naturally. This, for example, into the Yampa drainage, but it's intercepted by ditches, tunnels, and so forth, and it's it's brought over into another basin, uh, not of origin. So that's what we call trans mountain or trans basin diversions. It's where we take water that would normally flow into another river system and we intercept it and bring it over the divide into another basin. Um, Division One, the South Platte River Basin has the the highest number of Trans Mountain diversions, seventeen of them, I believe. Uh, those are the major ones. Some hydrology: the USGS estimates native flows in the South Platte at one point four million acre feet annually, and Trans Mountain water imports, so water that 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 we intercept or that's intercepted and brought over into Division One, is about four hundred thousand acre feet annually, on average. Uh, but they also estimate that the total annual surface water diversions, so the, these are diversions made out of the stream by water users, total 4 million. And, and for those of you doing the math, you think, well, how, how do you divert 4 million if we only have 1.8 million? Um, it's return flows we talked about. As you, as you divert that water from the stream, you apply it to a crop or it goes into a city municipal system, a large portion of that water comes back to the stream. And and I've seen many numbers, but but on average, uh, water is reused in the South Platte Basin. It's considered a workhorse four to seven times. That's re-diverted before it hits the state line or or it's completely consumed. So again, the, the reuse of water and the return flows in our system really make, especially the lower portion of South Platte. Yeah, question? The hydrograph um, map that you showed, uh -huh. does that include native, that native flows or is that native flows? That's native flows. Yeah, good question. <clears throat> a few more tidbits about South Platte. It's 23,000 square miles in surface area, pretty pretty large area. Um, our precipitation ranges between 10 and 17 inches a year. It, we have quite the elevation range from the divide to the to the eastern plains, 3,400 to 14,000 acre feet, and and a lot of irrigated acreage. This this number is a little outdated, but over 800,000 acres. But, but what I really want to point out when we're talking about administration and, and managing water, we talk about averages and it sounds easy, right? Yeah, we get 17 inches on average, but but a, a water commissioner one to, once told me there's no such thing as average, right? It is, it is what it is. And every year it's so different. It could be dramatically different from year to year. You know that with snowpack and, and this year, especially things look dire. Heard a question earlier about reservoirs. It, it was looking pretty dire earlier this year. You know, we had average snowpack, but it had been so dry the prior year. And then all the rains 
came and, and it's still raining. Hopefully it's raining out right now. And then, so, so this also shows that, that variance in snowpack down here, the, again, we always work off average. This, the smooth green line is average. The line above it was two or is 2023, the, the black line here. And then you can see the year prior, how different it was and, and also how it melts out. Not only the accumulation of snowpack, but as it, it starts to melt out as, as temperatures rise, it can be so drastically different here. You know, you think you're doing pretty good. You're just slightly below average. And then the bottom just falls out. All the snow's gone and, and the river starts to dry up. And if you don't get that, that monsoonal precip, it could be a really rough year. But, but I just want to point out, it, it's so variable year to year. Here's, here's a, a river gauging station right below the, the town of Greeley or the city of Greeley. I apologize. Um, it's our Kersey gauge. It, it's really a, something we monitor closely because it's where all the tributaries have come into the South Platte. Um, all the main tributaries and it, it heads east. So it's it's really a good measurement. And, and we try to compare year to year to figure out the, the health of the stream and especially what's going to happen uh, down, down river from Greeley down, including reservoir storage. So you can see here the variation that the dash smooth line is, is the historic average. And then you've got 2021, very dry all year. 2022, again, was even drier. We're thinking, oh no. And then the snow came and the precip and then the bottom fell on and got really dry. And then this year was looking even worse, very dry. And then we got all these big flood events, uh, especially out east, but really basin wide. And um, again, it's it's just really hard to predict and it, it's something you have to to manage. And we're right in the middle of that. We're administering, we're having to, to react to that real time. Overappropriated. Um, the South Platte River is highly and very overappropriated and it has been for a long time. What do I mean by that? That means there's more there's more water um, that's being claimed or needed than what the physical supply is. That's that's over appropriate. You just don't have you have way more supply. I'm sorry, way more demand than you have supply, and we have shortages much of the year. And and typically on the South Platte River Basin, and we'll get into what a call is, but water rights or appropriations that are 1860s, 1890s are are usually the the calls on the river. Those are the water rights that are getting the water. Uh, at times of shortage and anything junior to that or newer to that, they don't get water. So it's very over appropriated. Um, plans of augmentation allow replacement of out of priority diversions. And we'll get into what a, how that happens, what a plan of augmentation is here shortly. But I wanted to give you a glimpse of what our water commissioners do when we, we talk about administration. Again, they're boots on the ground, kind of making sure the structure and, and format runs smoothly and, and protects vested water rights. Um, but how does a water commissioner set a valid call? Um, again, a call is when there's there's not enough water in the stream system to supply all the water rights and all the demands. They have to determine, okay, how much water do I have? What's the date of that appropriation? And they set a call. And what we mean by a call is that water right is calling for their water. They have a right to it. They're the most senior. So anybody upstream of them, uh, whether it's up a tri tri tributary above them or on the main stem of, of the South Platte River, they're curtailed and not allowed to divert water until that water right's satisfied. And that water right, that short water, uh, they're required to, to have that demand and to dry the stream. So, so the water commissioners, I say every day, but every hour throughout the day, they're, they're looking at their stream gauges and they're talking to their water users, figuring out what their demand is. They're looking at the weather. You know, it really changes things if it's 100 degrees out and dry versus rainy and, and 60 degrees out. So. Um, they set a valid call based on the comparison of the river conditions to the demand. Um, and we require to dry, which which seems like an odd instance, but the reason we do that, think about it. If you have a water right and it's junior and you're upstream of a senior, the senior calls for their water. They say, Hey, I have the demand, I'm entitled to this water, I want all my water. So that water goes by your ditch. You have to turn your ditch down or turn it off. And then it gets down to that senior and they don't divert all that water. Well, you're injured. That was water you could have had that you sent down to that senior. And maybe somebody way junior to you is diverting downstream. So that's why we require they completely dry the river if they're the demanding call on the river and take all that water. Yes. How often does that actually happen that they dry the river? It, it's, we'll get into the mechanism, but every time they place a call and it happens, it was a big change from the Rio Grande Basin to the South Platte Basin because in the Rio Grande, we're always delivering to compact. So there was never a dry end of the river. 
here in order for them to divert, they, they have to dry the river. And, and most, if they're not drying the river, we won't honor their call if there's water going by them. Now, there's mechanisms in place. Um, fortunately, the Colorado Water Conservation Board uh, and the recognition in the 70s of the importance to not dry the stream and have a healthy stream system. There's, there's mechanisms in place, uh, minimum in-stream flows and other things that the Colorado Water Conservation Board has the ability to, to um, decree and maintain. So there's a mechanism for them to take water, senior water, donated water, change that water and, and leave it in the stream to protect the stream um, that's not owed to those seniors. It would be senior to the, the senior. Now, many of those minimum in-stream flows might have a, a more junior appropriation date. So if a senior is calling for water and the stream's dry or it's below what those minimum thresholds are, um, they wouldn't be leaving water in the stream. But there's other mechanisms for them to come up with water to leave in the stream. A good question. So, so conditions that commissioners look at prior to placing a call, we talked about the user has to be in priority. Um, it, it must be used in accordance with their water court decree. Uh, and usually a decree most times contains the, the amount, the diversion rate, what rate they can divert from the stream at, uh, the location of the point of diversion from the stream, and the use of that water, say irrigation. It's, it's very specific in those decrees. Uh, the water commissioners make sure they're not wasting water. So if they're calling for water, they're drying the river, we're sending all the water to them and half of it's blowing out the back end of the ditch back to the river. We're not going to, we're not going to honor their call. We're going to turn their head gate down so they're not wasting water and, and handle it that way. Um, they have to determine whether the user can get the water they are asking for without setting a call. So if, if, they want 50 CFS and they have 50 CFS. We're not going to let them place a call and curtail people above them because there's an adequate supply. And um, we also have to determine if they if we do place the call, is the water actually going to make it down to them or, or is it going to dry up in the stream or, or some other means? So here's kind of a visual. This is a crop. This is a ditch. Here's the river. So these are points of diversion. So there's 50 CFS in the river. Uh, this is prior appropriation administration. Um, so, so this water right in this scenario, there's, there's plenty of water. Um, this one has an 1895 priority for 75 CFS. This one has an 1880 priority for 50 CFS. Um, they, they place their call. They don't have enough water. This ditch may have been diverting. So we curtail this ditch. They're diverting zero. We send all 50 down to this ditch. 50 CFS goes down this ditch. They dry the river and below them zero CFS. Um, so that's when there's not enough water up above of the, other than to satisfy that senior, they place a call. Here's a scenario where the senior's demand is 25 CFS, not the full 50. You know, we talk to them, ask their water users, what's your demand? What, what do you need in your ditch to satisfy all your irrigators today? Uh, so in this instance, there's 50 CFS in the river. We'll, we'll use this priority date, set the call here. This ditch they'll bypass past their ditch and leave in the river. So it goes down to the senior priority, what their demand is up to their full amount. So here their demand's 25. So this ditch will divert 25 CFS and send the remaining demand, the 25 CFS down to this ditch. We call that a bypass call because we place the call. This ditch is bypassing enough water to keep the senior satisfied. We don't have to put the senior priority call on, which would pull even more water down because it doesn't do us any good to get more, more water down if, if, an upstream person senior to this, it caused injury. I, I saw a hand up, sorry. I just had a question. Oh, I said a good question. The first question was, um, when if water cannot be like wasted and the South Pot is a working river, how does that return flows fit back into it? Let's say they, mm -hmm. they pull all of their water on the fall, goes on to their irrigated field, comes back to the river. At what point is it considered wasted if like the dry up point, like at what yeah. distance back the head gate essentially? Yeah, that that's a really good question. So we we try to maintain ditches because you have to take more water than what you're going to be applying to carry it and build a head in the ditch. So it's, it's kind of a case by case determination by the water commission. But what waste would be if we figure to run a ditch efficiently, they need they need to tell out 10 percent, you know, usually 10 to 20 percent is a reasonable tell. So that's at the end of the ditch wasn't picked up by their their ditch users, but that's what's kind of needed to to get it all the way through their system. Now, if that jumps up to 
then we consider that waste. We turn turn that ditch down and may not honor their call. So hopefully that answers your your first question. Um, the second question was just the people who are determining where the priority rights are set and on call. Those are the water commissioners, like they're talking to their irrigators, or like that's their responsibility. Yeah, that's they have lots of responsibilities. Yeah. That's that's their primary one is is running the river, administering the river, and they. You know, when they go on vacation, I, I try to cover for them and not mess things up because I'm in the office. I, I, I'd rather be out in the field. But but, yeah, they usually start four or five in the morning looking at, you know, and today we have stream gauges. They used to have to drive out to critical locations on each stream or tributary and see where the water level was, figure out what their supply was manually. But now they can look at gauges. They start looking at what's coming. And there, there's a big timing aspect. It's a little it's it's easier maybe on the trips because it's you know, maybe a day delay. So you could look like on Clear Creek, for example, you could look up at Lawson above Idaho Springs and see what the flow is. You can look at the golden gauge and golden and see what the flow is. And you go, okay, I get, in about a day, here's what I expect at golden. Here's all my de demand in between. Whereas, you know, if you're at Greeley or you're at Sterling, you know, a release from Chatfield might take three to four days to get to you. So they're looking out four days ahead. They know what their demand is today. Um, you learn really quick as a water commissioner and administrator, you don't, you don't want to second guess yourself and start chasing because everything's messed up or it's always messed up. And, and sometimes when it's messed up, there's nothing worse than being a water commissioner. You think you have water coming to a senior, right? And there's zero water there when you tell them it's going to be there because you know, it's going to take three days to fix that. You can't just, it's, it's a natural system. It's, it's not a pipeline, but, but yeah, really good question. So they're looking at that, you know, five in the morning. Uh, we usually do calls in the South Platte river basin because it's such a busy, heavy working, so many people depend on it. Uh, they start calling their water users. It, it depends on the water user. If if they're not normally an early bird, they wait till six or 6.30 in the morning, but we make most of our decisions by seven where people start really getting antsy. And we usually do a, a call change at 8 a.m. of what the calls are. And, and this shows there could be multiple calls too. As you go down, we talked about priorities, how the more senior water rights are in the upper tribs, then you get on the main stem and they're kind of more senior as you go downstream to the state line. So, so again, you're looking at your supply and you might have like point A here, you you know, you have enough water up above to set an 1877 call. This water rights drying, taking all the water. These juniors aren't getting any water, but from this dry up, we have lots of return flows. We talked about and accretions coming back to the stream system. So this water commissioner knows, you know, he's talking to the water commissioner up here going, okay, what's your call going to be today? Oh, that means you're going to dry up here. So I'm going to only have this much water here. So they're determining what their supply is and what their demand is. So, so here they'll set a call. So here, everyone upstream of this point has to be curtailed to an 1877. Uh, from this point, everybody junior to 1879 from this point to here are curtailed. And, and that just works down every trib uh, and, and every on the main stem all the way to the state line. But yeah, and then... As soon as you get all that dialed in, it rains or something totally changes. And again, one of our our tasks um, and duties is to maximize beneficial use. So, so the water commissioners might say, hey, for the next four hours, I'm going to a junior, pick up all the water. You got a big slug coming through because of this rain event. So we, we try to only set call changes um, at 8 a.m., noon, and 4 p.m., preferably just 8 a.m., but we're never that fortunate because we start looking at the end of the day, like, well, if I don't change the call at 4 p.m. by tomorrow morning, I'm going to have a big hole in the river and we're, we're going to be in trouble. So, so they're, you know, they're talking throughout the day with their water users. And, and I've got some slides to that effect on, on how we communicate that. Yeah. That's a tough question. There's only a few instances our agency has to look at water quality and, and it's when we approve an exchange. So that's a water, an exchange is somebody takes water up above out of priority and to provide a substitute supply back to the stream downstream above somebody that would be impacted. So they, they don't see any difference downstream. They don't know they're diverting up here because they're putting another source in. And that's, that's the only time currently we're charged with that water supposed to be of, of equal quality that they're, their use and their historic benefit that that it's as equal quality. Um, and it gets really tricky there. And I'll, I'll just stop there. I'll, I'll get down a rabbit hole, but no great question. So normally no, people are confused. That's a wonderful question because we get water quality calls all the time. 
And it sounds funny to say, hey, we're not water quality. We're, we're quantity of water. That's really what we deal with. Um, now, we work with water users a lot because they might have water quality issues they're trying to deal with. And we figure out how they might be able to do things within the priority system and within their decrees. But, but yeah, we, we, don't, we don't look at any water quality when we're looking at priority and calls. Great questions. So when I talk about there could be many calls, I think this has nearly 20 calls. Oops, sorry. So the blue here, these are all the calls in parentheses. So Boulder Creek, for example, has six calls on the creek from the headwaters to the confluence with the St. Brain. Um, Big Thompson has four. The St. Brain has five. The Pooter has three. This is water district two and one. So right here, this is upstream of Greeley. This is between Greeley and and um Fort Mor between Fort Morgan and Sterling and downstream. So you can see the number of calls we had on this particular day um, on the river, including the compact. The, we'll get into the compact call, but at the state line, we have a call that impacts all of District 64 um, there. So a lot going on. And again, a lot of communication between the water commissioners and, and watching that all the time. And really, it's a teamwork effort. The water users, are, are they, they know what the streams do, they know their water rights, so they really help us out. And, and I mean that in a positive way. They're they're watching things as well. And if if they see something we we might not be seeing or they have a question about why we set a particular call, they, they know how to find us. Um, so it, it really is a teamwork. We I say we have 51 employees, but I think we have more like 100,000 out there watching things and helping us out. So I want to talk a little bit about plan of augmentation. I, I've talked about diverting water in priority and being curtailed. Well, as you can imagine, if you're a city and your municipal provider, you couldn't you couldn't handle if your water rights go in and out, right? Like, oh, sorry, people, you can't take a shower. Oh, wait, it's four o'clock. They changed the call. You can shower now. So that doesn't work. So in the 1969 Act, it, it, it lays out a plan of augmentation. And what that is, is it provides a replacement for, for any out of priority diversions uh, to make the stream system whole so, so you don't injure downstream water rights. And a lot of time we associate plans of augmentation with depletions caused by, by well pumping, those lag depletions back to the stream. When they impact the stream, th that's what we normally uh, relate a plan of augmentation to, but it could be a diversion out of the stream. It, it, it allows if, if, if an entity or a water user has a plan of augmentation to divert water out of priority and has a replacement source downstream, and they can operate that without injury to the downstream calling right, um, then they can do that. Uh, this is two examples in one. So on this side here, uh, this is for a plan of augmentation. Uh, here, you got 20 CFS in the stream. You got the senior water right with the call on down here, wanting 18 CFS. And you got this, this well filled, all these high capacity wells out here pumping. They're causing a depletion to the stream on this day during the call of five cubic feet per second. That's, that's if these wells hadn't been pumping, uh, never impacted the stream then there'd be five more CFS here than there is. So technically there'd be 15, but they have a decree to use consumable effluent coming from a wastewater treatment plant or an industrial plant. That coming back to the stream, five CFS of that flow, they can count towards a depletion. So again, the stream went from 20, now it's the 25 back down to 20. They made the stream whole. If you're down here diverting, you don't see any change in the stream system. That, that's really what a plan of augmentation is. Uh, here's another example of a, a replacement source here. It's recharge ponds. And when I say recharge, these are projects that retime the flows in the river. So they have a priority date. They divert water down a ditch. They put it into unlined ponds and let it percolate and soak into the ground system. And, and then they have a decree and they use modeling and engineering to figure out how long that water that soaks in the ground takes it to get back to the river. So they come up not only do they have a rate they can divert off, they recharge, but based on what they recharge into the ground, it, it also tells them how much water, where it shows up to the river, at what rate it shows up to the river. So place, uh, location, I'm sorry, location, time and amount back to the river. So here we have these wells pumping. They're causing a depletion to the stream. They've diverted water into these recharge ponds. They have water coming back um, that offset that depletion again. So this, this ditch here sees no, no impact. So just two different replacement sources, decreed replacement sources or legal sources for augmentation um, that are used. And just, just picture, we, I showed you how everything's tied together, all these tributaries, the timing, the main stem, and, and you know of all the municipalities, the industrial users, the irrigators, just, just try to imagine in your head what that looks like on this whole river system on a daily and hourly basis. And 
a lot of these recharge ponds, they're, they're required to project out what their depletions are gonna be from their well pumping and show that they have adequate replacement sources. So they'll, they'll strategically build these ponds so that percolation is delayed as it goes through the ground and they'll calculate all that. And they'll have ponds that, that might take 30 days to get back to the stream once they put the drop of water in there, 100 days, 365 days, 10 years. So they'll divert water in those ponds so they can project out based on a dry year and always having a call downstream that they have a replacement source coming back to the stream. And if they don't, they have to curtail their water users or their, their well users. On average in Division One, we recharge about 200,000 acre feet annually. Um, that's water that's diverted off the stream, put into recharge facilities uh, and allowed to percolate back to the system. Um, again, in a dry year, these most of these are junior water rights. The most senior ones are 70s, 1970s. Um, up into the 2000s. So if we have a really dry year, they use times when they normally could recharge and would be in priority. If they're not in priority, then then they can't recharge. So they, that means they don't have water coming back to the stream to be able to operate their wells in following years. So very important. These red dots, those are all our re recharge facilities or ponds um, on the South Platte River um, in the thousands. Continue with the day in the life of the Water Commission. I just want to give you a snapshot of how they figure all this out. Um, they go to our website, and, and so can the public, so can everybody. It's it's really nice. We have everything available digital now. So so they go there. You can go to your stream gauges. If you go to stations, here's, here's the website to the Colorado Decision Support System. We've kind of put all our tools on there now on this, this dashboard, so it's really handy. You can get to pretty much anything you want that's Division of Water Resources related. So... But they'll go there, they'll pull up their gauges um, on the stream that are critical. And also in our division, we have a lot of the, the main diversions and returns back to the stream also on telemetry. These are telemetry sites, which means they're available real time on our wet well, near real time. Usually it's lagged every hour, it downloads 15 minute data um, to our website, but it's through satellite and cellular um, and it makes it available to us. That's what I mean by telemeter. Um, I think, 10 years ago, we had less than 100 sites. It was mostly just stream gauges. Today, we have over 864 sites in Division One in the South Platte River Basin that are telemetered and available through our website. 437 stream gauges and 427 uh, ditches or diversion structures and, and release structures back to the stream. Um, this is just a snapshot when you click on that and you go to Water District 2, again, from, from Denver, kind of the Wheat Ridge area to Greeley. Um, these are the key structures. It'll bring up a table so you can click on things graphically. What, what this means until you zoom in, that means there's 20, 20 stations in that, that radius there in that circle. Uh, so if you zoom in, you can see each individual one and whether it's a ditch or, or a stream gauge, or you can go to the table format. If you know the name, our naming convention isn't really intuitive. I apologize for that. I usually go to the map and click on what I need because I know what I'm looking for. Um, but then, then you can open up and it'll show a graph. Of, of the 15 minute data near real time. So within the last hour, you can look at the last year, the last, it defaults to the last 10 days. It's, it's really useful. Um, these are what we call straight lines. So these are the main water diversions and operations in a water district. This is district eight from above Chatfield to uh, downstream of Chatfield Reservoir. You can see everything going on here, but this is what a, a water commissioner down here is dependent on all this. And this doesn't show every trip coming in either. But you can see all these operations and all the ditches that are going on in each one of these districts. So that's that's what the water commissioners like. I call them water whisperers. It's it's pretty amazing what they do. They really, I consider them experts in in hydrology, hydraulics, the timing, the gains and losses, uh, what a uh, rain events will do, uh, seasonal variations. It, it, it's amazing. I before we had all the telemetry in this available, I, I knew some of the old timers that actually slept under bridges to see see how things would change to see because you know that things were it wasn't happening what they thought would be their one get there and they were trying to figure it out but fortunately now we have stream gauges and it's telemetered and you can get up at four and instead of sleeping under the bridge you can you have it all right there at your fingertips and then for some of the more complicated um, water districts we built tools for our water commissioners here these are all the priorities and this is from the top of their stream system down so they know what their supply is. They could come in and say, well, here's the priority, the call I'm going to set at this location. And they could see how much water that eats up. And this just 
makes it easier. This will load all the telemetry data. They hit one button. Again, this is from the top of the basin to the bottom of the basin. It shows what all the diversions are right now, what all the stream gauges are, and they can they can um, guess or see what priority they think they're going to set and how that impacts their district. Sorry, I got to start speeding yeah. things up. Okay. I think I'm getting there. Um, and then they communicate the the calls out to the, the ones they're not talking to on their phone or by text. We put everything uh, on the website into our call tool. So, so anybody can go and see what the calls are, see what the historic calls are. And we have email lists to those. Um, and this is what administration today, I didn't, I didn't have a photo of what it used to look like, Parshall. Uh, very, hopefully everyone here knows that name because the Parshall flume was developed in Fort Collins. Um, a lot of wonderful history in our backyard and here at this university. But, but near real time, we got automated gate systems on the South Platte. Everything's telemetered um, through cellular. You know, here's big diversions. I think this is at Coors Brewery on Clear Creek at Golden. This is the ditch diversion that fills Stanley Reservoir, 26 miles away um, from, from Clear Creek. And, and that's just a little bit of what they do, right? That's running the river, but storage rights, reservoir rights, um, give very detailed exchanges, substitution, augmentation plans, minimum in-stream flows, making sure those are not being injured real time and, and streams throughout segments are being maintained. And augmentation of in-stream flows, uh, groundwater, uh, augmentation plans and, and of course, non-decreed diversions, very important, right? We do a really good job on administering decrees and legal diversions, uh, but we unfortunately come across a lot of illegal diversions we have to deal with and, and we're constantly educating the public, which is a good thing. We'd rather educate them so they don't make an illegal diversion. So I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna switch gears really quick and talk about compacts. Um, in division two, we have two compacts we administer, the South Platte River Compact. I'm only gonna talk about that one today, the Republican River Compact. And also we have a Supreme Court case, Wyoming v. Colorado that impacts and, and allocates how we administer the Laramie River in Colorado with, with our neighbors to the to the north. And an interstate agreement, again, up, up in Wyoming on Sand Creek, it's an agreement. So I only have one slide on the South Platte Compact. I, I don't know, I, I didn't get to see the presentation from last week from our, our neighbors across the border. But it, it, it really, especially coming from the Rio Grande Basin, it's, it's pretty straightforward and, and simple. I'll go through it real quick. Um, I'm gonna, I should put it at the top, but important to note it, it was uh, ratified between the states, Colorado and Nebraska in, in 1923. It only impacts water district 64. So no matter what you hear about compact, it only impacts water district 64. It doesn't go above district 64. Um, this shows, this is Julesburg, the state line, near the state line of uh, Colorado, and Nebraska here. And, and uh, district 64, really the compacts to the westerly boundary of the Washington County line. You can see the, I'm having trouble seeing that. Hopefully you can see the county line here where it impacts the South Platte River. It's near the town of Hill Rose. That's the blue dot here. Um, so anytime you hear about compact and deliveries or anything, it only impacts this area. If we have zero flow at the state line, we curtail any water right only in this area um, to a certain date. We'll get into that. It does, we could have a junior, you know, with the 2005 water right diverting upstream of that. So I just, just want to make that clear. But, um, and it really has two seasons. The compact lays out. Um, the, what I call the irrigation season, but it's April 1 to October 15. It requires that um, Colorado must maintain daily flow of 120 CFS at the state line. And, and I have article references there. Um, and I think I provide, hopefully I provided the compact, okay, for, for reading material. Um, so that has a water right of June 14, 1897. So if the Julesburg gauge, which we actually have three gauges there, more for high flows, it goes in three channels, but during most flows, there's only one channel, it's our, our Julesburg gauge. Um, if, if flow drops below 120, we, we place a compact call on, just like a ditch, we would put a call at the state line, which means of June 14, 1897. So anyone in this section that has a priority date, junior to June 14, 1897 is curtailed. They can't divert water. Uh, until we don't have that compact call, until we have 120 CFS or more at the state line. And that includes 
augmentation plans. So depletions caused by wells pumping that are hitting the stream. When we put that call on, they have to replace their depletion to the stream um, at their location to make sure the stream's whole and they're not causing a depletion or diversion from the stream. Um, so people get confused there because they hear the 120 CFS and think we always have to deliver 120 CFS and that's not the case. It requires uh, that there be 120 CFS at the state line or we curtail junior diversions upstream. And, and that's it during the irrigation season. Now during the winter season, it's been relatively easy for hundred years and now it may change. I think you probably heard about that last week, but October 16th to March 31st, the remainder of the year, um, there's no requirement for delivery to the state line, except uh, the, the, the compact has the Nebraska, it allowed, recognize that Nebraska may construct and actually had already constructed portions of the Perkins County Canal near Ovid, Colorado. So that's this blue star is about where their diversion is. And there's remnants still of that Perkins County Canal there next to the Pony Express, kind of neat, lots of history, but um, the, the Pony Express Trail. But that's that's where that point of diversion would be. So what that means is if if uh, they have a water right for 500, a rate of 500 CFS, um, yeah, there it is, with a priority in 1921. So that means we would curtail, if, if they don't have their 500 CFS, there is a ditch, they can divert it, there's a need for it. We would curtail everybody upstream only to the westerly boundary of the Washington County line. It doesn't go above that. Uh, that would be junior to that until they're they're satisfied. Um, now, a few disclaimers: the compact also allowed uh, that, irregardless of the date, that Colorado had the right to thirty five thousand acre feet of storage in use by Colorado that we could take before we honor this this uh, Perkins County Canal water right. Uh, and I also want to point out we we have a big reservoir out here. It diverts up here near Sterling in the Harmony number one ditch, but Julesburg or Jumbo Reservoir, just the messenger, there's a big debate on what it should be called and some like Jumbo, some like Julesburg, but um, it has a water right that's senior to the Perkins County Canal. It, it's got a water right of, of um, 1902 and a storage right of 28,178 acre feet. And it, it's generally calling and, and filling that reservoir all winter long, uh, just depending on the year, how low it was when we went into the fill season, when they came in a priority. Um, but that, even if we had to place a call at the Perkins County Canal, it, it would be junior to this uh, Julesburg Re Reservoir priority, so they could keep keep diverting that. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of questions um, that the states are going to have to work through, you know, three states agreement, endangered species. There's just, it's it's really complicated, complex issue, but um, you know, I just want to point out Colorado has complied and remains in compliance with the South Platte River Compact. We have every intention of continuing to comply, and we're having lots of good conversations with, with our good neighbors to the east. So I like this little, I don't even know what this diagram is, but it, it kind of what water administration on South Platte River is. And again, a lot of teamwork, not just our agency, but all the water users out there. There, it's it's a wonderful team teamwork and and when you step back and look at it, it's just amazing. I know Justice Hobbs used to just brag on, especially the water commissioners. They're, it's amazing to see what they do, but he, he bragged on them every opportunity he got and was amazed how they made all these complex decrees that we sit in the office and, and we negotiate and they get entered by the courts, how they, how they make them work on the ground and it's interrelated. So, sorry, it was a, that was a lot. Any questions? Yes, right there. I'm curious to hear your opinion on climate change going forward and how some of these water structures are going to impact just kind of like economic society and people if the priority is for senior water rights. What kind of like unintended consequences do you foresee some of them in the future? Yeah, I mean, just kind of repeat, summarize. Oh, yeah. So how how will climate change impact some of these senior water rights, or, or for that matter, not senior water rights, um, and and impact just consequences or or society in general? And I mean, we're seeing it on the Colorado River, right? Anytime there's less water than there was, it, it's a real trigger point. We talk about how over appropriated 
the South Platte River is. So if, if we have less supply, that means someone's going to go without water and, and those more juniors are going to fill that first. Um, so what might have been a, a senior, a real dependable water right, um, when streams were, were more used, might not be as dependable if there's less water in the stream and the calls come on earlier and they go more senior. Uh, another thing I'm, I'm seeing, and it's by necessity and it's a good thing, but I think the reuse and successive use. So when I say reuse and successive use, I mean, um, people have a decree or a right. Trans Mountain water um, can be reused and successively used to extinction. Um, they don't have to continually do that to maintain dominion and control of it. They can not do that for 50 years and then and start exercising that. But but I, I'm seeing the need, you know, anytime there's a project to bring more water from out of basin into our basin, we want to make sure we're using the water efficiently and effectively. So so there's been a drive, which is a good thing for reuse and successive use to, hey, use all that water you're bringing over there. But we're really seeing an uptick on reuse and successive use. What does that mean? That it's a good thing, right? That means they're more efficient, effective with their water supplies, but that water that wasn't reused and successively used was in the stream and went downstream. So that could really have an impact on the calls as well. So it's, it's kind of a good thing, but that'd be a consequence of, of more efficient use and reuse of water is there's less water in the stream below that. So it, it just changes the pinch points. So hopefully that, that answers your question. Send a question here still. Uh, yeah. On the Williams of the Glade Reservoir, that's going to have a really junior water rate. Mm -hmm. What's kind of their strategy to be able to build that reliable? Yeah. So, so a couple things. And I think Northern's going to be here in Northern Water in a week or two. So they'll, I'm sure they'll, I'm sure they'll hammer Glade Reservoir in there. But, but yeah, it's a very junior water rate. Right? I, hmm, I should know that. I, I want to say it's 1980 vintage, 1989. So, so it's been on the books for a long time not compared to other water rights, but yeah, their plan is in times of plenty uh, during high flows, they'll take some of that high flow off the river and put into the reservoir. The reservoir is not on stream. They'll have to pump that into the reservoir and then, then release it back to the stream. There's, there's also um, another reservoir, Gelton Reservoir, that's part of that. So, so the thought is water they would normally take in ditches upstream, let's say the city of Fort Collins, um, they'll leave, leave in the stream to help the flows through that section. And then they'll have Gelton Reservoir down below that's releasing water into some of those ditches lower down to, to satisfy their demand instead of taking it, you know, 30 miles upstream down the ditches. Um, so, so that'll help. That's how they're planning on managing that. You know, you're in a dry year and you wonder how will you ever fill this? And then you get monsoonal rains and a wet year and you're thinking, wow, I wish we would have had that to fill right now. So, but but yeah, it's it's a very interesting system. I think I don't know who's presenting, but though Brad Wind, yeah, Brad will do a good job talking about Glade in more detail. And hopefully, if I got it wrong, he'll he'll correct me. But that's pretty high level. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so with the Glade Reservoir, you know, with the commissioners or just the division in general, what's the process for? Maybe including some like new water modeling specific, specifically for conjunctive use. You know, like a paper comes out or this model is used to measure groundwater flow. How are those that process? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> a complicated question. Oh, yeah. So the question was the water commissioners or division water resources when when studies um, about conjunctive use as far as groundwater flows or supplies um, come out. How do we implement that? Um, I kind of went through what our our authority is. We're not necessarily a rulemaking or policy making. We're we're more of a administrator enforcement. So typically we follow what the wet water in the stream is and what the colors of that water are and the decrees and. Uh, through the legislative process and 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 the uh, judicial process, the water courts, entities will incorporate that into to new decrees or existing decrees and try to deal with that. We, you know, we talked real high level about augmentation plans and 
recharge and and well pumping it it's you know it's all modeling and, and supply and conjunctive use really and very highly discussed or, or debated however you want to look at it during that court case and and kind of drives that it, it gets challenging because you tend to lock those in place based on the technology and then something else comes out down the road it, it's a little hard um, to implement that many times they'll have to get a different decree or amend an existing decree to change those parameters but but we're typically just in the role of following those existing decrees and you know it's really hard because you might have a decree that estimates and has modeling of what 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 the return flows might be and what water is in the river so us as administrator when somebody comes to you and they're they're operating an exchange and they're taking five cfs out of the river because they're modeling in their decree says there's five cfs down here and you you go over there with them you're like, there's nothing here but the decree says there is so we we allow those exchanges so it gets it gets really complicated but um you know it's cutting edge i i think the water community as a whole they're they're on top of it um through both the as i said the legislative and judicial branch trying trying to deal with that and implement things and you know, if something needs to change, again, that, that might be through the legislative process where they change statute or, or the laws. Yeah, good question. I think we should wrap it up, but let's give another hand for our tour. Thank you for having me. And um, if you want to come up and chat afterwards. Yeah, I can stick around. That for a couple minutes. And... All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Great questions. We have two interns from CSU right now. <laughs>